everyone, welcome back to Franchi Talks Japanese Art. I am Franchi and I'm back with a new video. And today is a special one for several reasons. The first one is that I won't be talking about Japanese art. And the second one is that we are outside. <laughs> it's not uh, something I do often, but we are in depth in the gardens of the Prinzenhof Museum, which is a beautiful museum in the Netherlands. And the reason why we're here is that a few weeks ago I came to the museum to see an exhibition called Jing de Gen, A Thousand Years of Porcelain. And if you know me, you know that as soon as I hear the word porcelain, I have to go see it. And the exhibition was very beautiful, of course, but when I was there, I also saw one object which really struck me and it made me think about some things I read previously about decorative arts and kind of inspired me to make this video. And so in the video, I will talk about this object, this bowl, and then I will also talk about the mass production of porcelain and ideas regarding craftsmanship, a little bit of theory. But so let's start from the beginnings and let's go see the bowl. Let's go. So what we are looking at today is this bowl. This is a fish bowl which was produced in China during the Qing period, specifically during the emperor the reign of the Emperor Qianlong. And it is a fish bowl which is very interesting because in China there had been the habit to keep uh, goldfish for, let's say, decorative purposes since the, Ming since the 7th century. And this kind of bowl had already been produced since the Ming period. And in fact, we can see this from the decoration in the inside of the bowl. We can see a decoration of carbs amongst the seagrass. And it kind of tells us the use that this bowl would have had. So, as the exhibition points out, there is a saying in Jing De Gen, which is that it takes 72 hands to make one pot. And in fact, if we look at the outside decoration of the fish bowl, we can see exactly that. We can see that there is a continuous decoration which depicts the making of ceramic bowls in the capital of porcelain, Jing De Gen. And we can see every single phase or every step of the production of porcelain. So we can see the kneading of the clay, uh, the shaping of the bowls, placing the foot ring at the bottom of the bowl, and then again we can see quality controls, painting, glazing, and finally carrying the completed bowls to the kiln, placing them in sagars, which are like box-like containers which protect the ceramics during the firing, and then finally firing the ceramics in the kiln. And we can see that uh, each step of, the produ of this production is uh, made by a different craftsman. A different person works on each action. So it means that these are all specialized craftsmen. So I am now back home because I wanted to discuss a little bit the ways which we saw at the exhibition and especially what we have learned about the mass production of pottery at Jing De Gen. So take what I have already talked about and look at it more from a theoretical point of view. So when I was at the exhibition, something that sparked in my mind was that I remember about a book which I bought a while ago and I have it here. And it's called 10,000 Things the module and mass production in Chinese art and it was written by Lothar Lederhose. And this is a great book because Lederhose really goes into detail into the production of uh, various uh, types of Chinese art and his main uh, ideas is to look at how art was mass produced in through cha throughout Chinese art history and how it also used modules when creating various types of art and it's a fantastic <laughs> book and of course it's really interesting and I wanted to have a look at it 
while looking at our uh, main theme of today, which is of course the production of porcelain at Jindigen. Of course, Leather Hose goes into this topic uh, uh, in depth as well, so we will be looking at mostly at what he wrote. The, one of the main uh, topics of Le De Hose, or one of his main arguments, is that throughout Chinese art history, uh, art was created in locations which we could today indicate with the modern world of factory. I feel like we need to define this because uh, when we use the word factory, especially today, there could be a variety of negative connotations attached to it. For example, factory might uh, include in our mind the idea of the production which uses machinery rather than handmade production or for example generally negative connotations attached to the locations, the environmental issues, uh, workforce issues and so on. But it doesn't have to be this way. We can define a factory uh, by looking at Lederhose's ideas or concept of it differently. For example, it doesn't include, doesn't have to include machinery, it can simply be based on work made by people, by craftspeople, just simply in mass production. So there needs to be a mass production of objects to have sizable workforce, so a big amount of people working at these locations. And these people work in a structured manner throughout the year, it's not temporary work. And also something that we need to point out is that they work often with a division of labor, so each worker performing a certain task. So if we take into account the mass production, the great number of workforce, the structured work and the division of labor, we can indeed state that the person of the gene the gen was created through factory work. And just to get an idea of how huge the amount of uh, porcelain made at the gen was, we can state or give an, as an example that in the 16th century, Jing the gen worked for producing the porcelain and ceramics used at the Imperial Court. So the Imperial Court of China could commission, ask Jing the gen to produce the wares and in the year 15,077 the amount of porcelain that was requested was almost 175,000 pieces. This is a huge amount <laughs> as you can understand. So the way in which Jing De Zhen worked in producing these pieces by, was by having hundreds of kilns in the same city and these kilns hired the local people who worked uh, at a variety of roles uh, which could be master potters, master painters, uh, master painters using colors, uh, masters who simply worked at uh, signing or marking let's say the each ball for the kin where it was made and then again there was a variety or swathes of assistants for each Mas for each master who worked, for example, at mixing the clay, preparing sagas for the kin, and so on and so on. So another element which Lederhose focused on, and I also would like to talk about today, is the use of modules when it comes to the painted decoration on porcelain. And Lederhose makes a good example by using the cargo of the Gelder Malsen, a boat which was transporting a Dutch boat which was transporting uh, Chinese porcelain into Europe and shipwrecked and the contents of the cargo were brought back to the surface in 1985 so Lederhosen focuses on the cargo he focuses especially on the plates bowls and he looks at the decoration, so what he finds is that there is a limited amount of elements which are reoccurring in the decoration of these pieces. Namely, it's mostly flowers, trees and pagodas. These uh, elements are very simple, simply painted with basic strokes and each of them can be considered a module. The most interesting thing is that these modules can be combined. So, for example, one module, one tree or one flower 
could stand on its own on a very small bowl. But what if the bowl is bigger? The painter could choose to combine different modules to create a new design. So for example, one flower with one tree, or one tree and a pagoda, which make up a new landscape. And it was up to the painter which modules to choose and how to combine them. So what is interesting to note is that in the end result, each bowl or plate could be a little bit different. A painter could use simply very different strokes when uh, designing each module and what if they combine modules differently in each plate they, they set or various plates or balls or objects in general could have a sense of uniformity because of using the same recording modules but at the same time uh, an effect of variety because not, not, not two of them would end up being exactly the same so everything we've talked about up until now was kind of practical and factual, how porcelain was made, how did Jim de Jean work. However, I would like to take some time to talk about it from more of a theoretical point of view. And this is because I feel there should be more space for discussing the meaning of craftsmanship and the value of art which is mass produced by craftsmen, unknown craftsmen. And I feel like this is necessary because I studied art growing up and every time I was uh, studying art history, for example at school, growing up in Europe, the focus tended to be on the work of the individual artist. And in general when it came to uh, studying art uh, in high school or university, a lot of the times the focus is not on decorative arts. And as we mentioned, uh, if, we men if we use the words of mass production or factory production, the connotations that they tend to have are quite often negative. However, when I was at the exhibition in Dev, I was uh, struck by the porcelain. Of course, I'd seen porcelain before, but in hindsight of reading this book and others, I really um, was amazed by the strength of the collaboration of these craftsmen, by the quality of their work, which was after all not signed, not the work of a one individual creative genius. And so I thought for this video my aim would be to give a different way to approach these works, these works made by craftsmen. And so here we are, I will uh, talk about two theories um, which are a little bit more theoretical. The first one, of course, by Lederhosen, which we have already been looking at his ideas, and the second one by the Japanese art historian Yanagi Soetsu. So Lederhosen, he talks about this issue about uh, art and the mass production and the meaning of art, he talks about it in terms of creativity. He wonders if we can consider this art creative, which is after all one of the main ideas that come when we talk about art. And what Lederose argues is that he looks at treaties and writings from China to try to interpret how China has approached art throughout the centuries. And I think he comes up with a very fascinating answer. Because what he says is that in China the ultimate creator is nature, is considered to be nature. So nature creates. It creates with forms, it creates shapes and it uses the material that it has at its availability to create the natural world which we see. So the act of creating by its, its existence will always be compared to the creation in nature um, by its very own meaning. So nature is the ultimate role model when it comes to creating. And what people can strive for is uh, creating like nature. So not imitating nature in a meaning of realism or making it look lifelike by creating in the same way, according to the same principles which, with which nature creates. 
So nature tends to create <laughs> in a mass, with mass reproduction. For example, we think of one tree, it has a huge number of leaves, which have the same shape repeated again and again. However, at the same time, nature creates with minuscule differences along the way. For example, if we think again of a tree, it has a huge amount of leaves, which are all in the same shape. However, each of them is slightly different. No two of them are identical if we look at them and put them side by side. And so we can say that it's the same for the, for, for the makers such thing a Jing De Zhen. They produce in huge numbers, but when we take each bowl or each plate, it's hard to find two that are exactly the same, even if the variety is in the individual stro stroke of the painter. And for this, we can deduce that the craftsmen at Jing De Zhen they created naturally, they created like nature does, which I think is an extraordinary way to look at it. And when I read this part about nature, I couldn't not think of the theories by another art historian who is called Yanagi Soetsu. Yanagi Soetsu was active in Japan in the 20th century. He was the founder or one of the founders of the Minge movement, the movement of Japanese folk crafts. And he wrote a lot about his ideas and I've been reading them too. If you know me, I have, you know, I have an obsession with this book. It's called The Art of the Beauty <laughs> of Everyday Things. And it is, let's say, a combination of a variety of his articles and essays. And in it, he focuses on the value of craftsmanship and folk art. So let's talk about it for a little bit. So according to Yanagi Soetsu, the people should strive to be surrounded by reliable handmade objects that should be beautiful in their simplicity. And to reach this idea of statues where everyone is surrounded by these kind of objects, of course, these objects have to be mass produced because they need to be available for everyone to buy and they also need to be produced cheaply for the same reason, to be affordable by everyone and to be used in their everyday life. And so Yanagi argues that to achieve these statues, uh, folk artists or craftsmen, they should work as an industry. Folk art should be a mass production industry rather than, than, the, than relying on an individual maker or an individual artist, otherwise we will never reach this place. The focus, according to him, is really not on the individual. In fact, he argues most of these objects in the past, they were not signed because they are everyday objects made for everyday use by everyday people for everyday people. And I will also add a little bit which he talks about in a different chapter, but these objects, they sometimes were so beautiful, so aesthetically pleasing in their simplicity, that they even ended up being used in the tea ceremony. So in the Japanese tea ceremony, we can find objects of, that are extremely valued, but they don't even bear a signature. They were made by an unknown folk craftsman. <laughs> When, when reading his, uh, his writing, I once, myself, once again encountered the idea of creating naturally. Now, according to Yanagi Suetsu, uh, Japanese and also craftsmen from all over the world, they are able to create in a natural, spontaneous way. So I would like to read a couple of pages of his book to explain and understand what he means by this because it's easier and more direct to use his words rather than mine. So I hope you enjoy my reading. <laughs> what he says is that when it comes to these objects, these everyday objects, they should be cheaply produced in volume. Volume, you may think unimportant, but actually it has a crucial effect on the beauty of these handcrafted objects. Repetition is the mother of proficiency. 
Large demand calls for massive supply. Massive supply requires repetitive production. A repetitive production eventually results in technological perfection. This is particularly true with division of labor, when one skill can be polished to consummation. The process of manufacturing consists chiefly of this simple cycle, doing over and over the same pattern, forming over and over the same shape. Those who have mastered these skills are no longer aware of the techniques they, are, they use. They have become one with the task at hand, free of all self-awareness and thoughts of artistic manipulation, effortlessly applying themselves to the job at hand. They may be cheerfully talking and laughing as they work, but most surprising is their speed. Speed is necessary if they are to make a living. Thousands of times, ten thousands of times, it is this repetition that frees their hands from thought. It is this freedom that is the matter of our creation. This is the secret of their craft. Its beauty is the necessary result of mass production. And these common so-called Michelinian sculptors are fully mature. Their technical consummation of years of endeavor, hard earned sweat and endless repetition. This is how their freedom was won. Rather than the products of human hands, they should be viewed as works of nature. So we can see that Yenagi said to key things that, that craftsmen working again and again at the same shape, at the same act, they can really create without, I don't want to say without thinking, but um, spontaneously, naturally, and this is what he considers the main achievement of craftsmanship. And I also think that this is a beautiful idea, and I, did, I really love how he is amazed by the spontaneity, the way in which these craftsmen make their objects. And I was also amazed when <laughs> reading this book and thinking of these ideas. So. This is what the idea that I wanted to leave you with, uh, with this video was we looked at two kind of approaches on how to understand art and how to think of decorative art and which is often mass produced, for example, in the case we looked at today of porcelain. And <laughs> this is it really. I just think it's important sometimes to look at art from uh, a different point of view and so i hope you enjoyed the video and if you want as usual you can let me know if you have any specific thoughts about this topic or in general about porcelain and jing the gem and so on so i i'm in love with ceramic so i like to think i like to hear everyone's ideas about this topic and of course if you like to the video you can decide to subscribe to the channel because i will be making more videos so you can see more this is this was my first video not talking specifically about japanese art but i would like also to talk about different types of asian art and from now on maybe i will try to keep some variety generally I tend to just talk about what i like <laughs> And if you also like the videos, you can decide to support the channel for more, vi more videos coming in the future. It always helps me. And you can find the link in the description for my Ko-Fi, where you can just uh, give a donation to the channel. And the last thing is that if you want to keep in touch between one video and the other, you can want to see what I'm up to, you can also follow me on my social media accounts, on Instagram and Facebook. But for now, I just hope to see you again soon and bye!